we've been doing this Babylon series talking about the city and the tower built in the plain of Shinar. And this time we're going to be looking at the giants that were a part of this culture that are recorded in history and also in scripture. But before we actually jump into the giants after the flood, we have to look at giants before the flood. This is going to help us have that context that we're always talking about. We're always talking about context, right? So to help us have this context of why and how were there giants after the flood, we're actually going to look at the scriptures that help us define why there were giants before the flood and then jump into the post-flood giants. So it's going to make a lot of sense because it actually is going to, as you as you guys uh, may remember, this series is covering ancient Babylon as well as present-day Babylon. And then also we'll be looking at future Babylon. So all these things, what we're doing is laying a groundwork, a foundation for understanding what we're going to be talking about in the other segments, the present time, present day Babylon and the future Babylon. So um, don't don't duck out too soon because this is this is going to really hopefully my, my prayer is that as we we go through these fundamental concepts, hopefully they are engaging and uh, exciting for you to learn but it's going to make the future concepts that much more easy to grasp and to um, see in the scriptures themselves. So let's, let's dig in guys. Let us dig in. Let's look at some pre-flood giants. Enoch chapter seven, which is one through six and all the others together with them. That's the rebellious angels. This is what we were called the watchers and we're, we'll define them. It says all the others took together with them, took unto themselves wives and each chose for himself one. They began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And they, and they the women, became pregnant and they bare great giants, whose height was 3,000 L's, who consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when man could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. Then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. Now I want to stop real quick make a little bit of caveat because we've already done a couple episodes on uh, the idea of veganism and how far back into scripture sacrifice goes and what is defined as sacrifice and the idea of eating of the meat of the sacrifice, which was a duty of the priest. This is behavior that we see and we, we, we showed through scripture that was taught from the angels to Adam in the garden. Then Adam is then practicing that same behavior when bringing forth his first fruits and his tithes and other sacrifices since Adam would have been a priest over his family. This is why in Genesis 4 we see Cain and Abel bringing forth sacrifices of their um, to, to the priest, which would have been Adam, in honor to Yahweh as part of the commandments. Um, as we all know the story, Cain's sacrifice was not accepted. Abel's, who was a tender of the flock, his sacrifice was accepted. Now, not because he brought forth an animal and Cain brought forth uh, the fruits of the ground, but simply because Cain uh, Abel's sacrifice, which consequently happened to be a, a lamb from the flock it was it was divided properly he brought it forward in the right manner according to the commandments whereas as Cain did not divide his properly did not bring forth the amount he was supposed to so uh, this is what we can find in Genesis 4 7 and the Septuagint so as a result of that we see that they're practicing what's called sacrifices which meant they were bringing forth a specific amount which Deuteronomy 18 goes in to explain to us that this is a tithe amount and of the tithes brought forth, the priest who receives that tithe of that sacrifice would eat of that sacrifice, both the vegetables, the wine offering, the bread offering, the lamb or the goat or whatever, the animal that was brought forth. So that was a part of the portion that was according to God's instructions for the priests, which are the same before the flood, after the flood and on into eternity, into the millennial reign and forever. The portion for the priest was to eat of that sacrifice that's brought forth. So when it says here in Enoch, first Enoch seven, one through six, when it when it tells us that these giants, these children of the watchers, the watchers, these rebellious angels that were sent to the earth, we're going to go over that verse here in a few minutes. And while they were here, they lusted after women, they fell and they rebelled against their mission and uh, betrayed the father, you know, his trust to send them here. And they actually started trying to make their own families and they took wives. They taught them some bad stuff. We're going to go over the stuff they taught them in just a few moments. But the wives then had children. Those That offspring was called the giants or the Nephilim in the Hebrew. And this idea was that they turned against uh, mankind because the acquisitions of men could no longer sustain them. 
Now, a lot of people like to argue that this uh, translation here from the RH Charles that says 3000 L's, they like to argue that this means 4,500 feet. Um, I do not think that's what the translation is. I personally have never seen the word. There's controversy with how the measurement of the term L's from an ancient, uh, you know, an ancient form of of measurement, how that's actually translated into the English. So yes, the giants were tall. That's why they're called giants. And we're going to go over all the, the descriptions of why they are that tall. But I don't think that they were 4,500 feet tall, because um, then you'd be talking about. Um, then you'd be you, then you would be talking about truly bigger than even what the Titans were described in ancient Greek culture. And we're going to go over ancient Greek culture tonight. So this is where I don't, I don't think that's how we would translate that measurement um, personally. And that, and that's why there's controversy amongst ancient translators on how that's actually what that unit of measurement truly meant in the past. So, but what, but what I want to get at here by explaining the concept of the priesthood and the sacrifice is this idea that when the giants turned against mankind and started devouring mankind, and then it says they sinned against the birds, beasts, reptiles, and fish. This means they engaged in outright cannibalism and it, first against mankind because the Nephilim, the giants, were part of mankind. They were born of human women but fathered by the watchers, which were actual spiritual beings. So this is this concept of a hybrid that should not have been. This is why they're considered you know, sons of destruction, if you will. So they then turned against righteousness, and we're going to read about that later. Uh, this is why verse six there it says that they devoured flesh and drank blood, which we see later on in scripture as being a part of occultic behavior that is not a part of God's righteous instruction on what type of animals to eat and when to eat them and how to cook them and all that kind of stuff, right? So they're doing everything backwards. And in verse six, it calls them the lawless ones. So this is a this gives you all this context. It's not trying to tell you that eating meat is bad. Definitely eating humans is bad. But it's but it's specifically what they were doing as they were eating the animals and the man and mankind, which we already know that cannibalism eating mankind is bad in, in scripture. But this idea that they were eating and drinking blood as well, this is this is what um, is a huge no no in the father's instructions for living. So this is uh, if we keep going here, we're going to get some uh, validation in Jubilees chapter five. We get a little bit of um, extra explanation here where it talks about. And it came to pass when the children of men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the angels of God saw them on a certain year of this jubilee and that they were beautiful to look upon. They took themselves wives of whom all they chose and they bare unto them sons and they were giants. The lawlessness increased on the earth and all flesh corrupted its way alike. Men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walks on the earth, all of them corrupted their ways and their orders and they began to devour each other and lawlessness increased on the earth and every imagination of the earth, the thoughts of all men was thus evil continually and god looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt and all flesh had corrupted its order and all that were upon the earth had wrought all manner of evil before his eyes and he said that he would destroy man and all flesh upon the face of the earth which he had created but noah found favor or that is grace before the eyes of the lord so it's specifically explaining not only was there lawlessness not only was there uh, the giants uh, devouring mankind there was cannibalism there was occultic behavior happening but there was also um, the animals had corrupted their ways. That's their behaviors and their orders. That's how they were created. So this is what we actually do see later on in history. We'll get there in a few moments. The rest of Jubilees 5, 6 through 11 says, and against the angels whom he had sent upon the earth. Remember, that's the rebellious angels that took wives and had the giant children. He was exceedingly angry and he gave commandment to root them out of all their domain or their dominion. And he bade us to bind them in the depths of the earth. And behold, they are bound in the midst of them are kept separate. And they and against their sons went forth the command from before his face that they should be smitten with the sword and be removed from under heaven. That means their physical bodies are killed. That's why that's how you're smitten with the sword. And he said, my spirit shall not always abide on man, for they also are flesh and their days shall be one hundred and twenty nine, twenty years. And he sent his sword into their midst that each should slay his neighbor. And they began to slay each other till they all fell by the sword and were destroyed from the earth and their fathers were witnesses of their destruction. That's the fallen, the rebellious angels that took wives and had children. They watched their, their giant sons kill each other off. And after this, they were bound in the depths of the earth forever until the day of the great condemnation. That's going to be the revelation 20 great white throne judgment at the end of the millennial reign. When judgment is executed on all those who have corrupted their ways and their works before the Lord. And he destroyed all from their places. And there was not left one of them whom he judged not according to all their wickedness. 
we have a big, a little bit more description uh, from Jubilees. And now here we have the most traditional understanding that most people see in Genesis 6, 1 through 5, just to show everyone who may be new to this idea that there is an abundance of parallel in ancient manuscripts. And here in Genesis 6, 1 through 5, now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he's also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. When the sons of God, that's the rebellious angels, those watchers, came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was evil continually. Now, I just want to point out real quick that the Nephilim is what being called the giants in the book of Jubilees here. But it's the angels. And look at verse 6, guys. Look at verse 6 here. It's the angels against the angels whom he had sent upon the earth. So when we read in the book of Enoch that these 200 watcher angels that came down, they saw women that they were fair and they took wives of whom they chose. That's because they were sent down here. So they were sent here to help govern mankind, to help them. But once they got here, a different story happened because yes, angels can sin too. Angels have free will. And so this is why they had to be dealt with. They had to be judged. And since that point, no other angel has ever sinned like that again. Now, there's a lot of people who are familiar with this topic. There's there's two sides of the debate people try to hold to, which is, well, if if there were giants, if that's how the giants were created before the flood and we see giants after the flood, well, then other angels must have done this. I understand that seems like a logical argument, but the scriptures tell us otherwise. So this is why I'm going to go through the scriptures tonight, and I'm actually going to explain how these giants were created before the flood so that we see after the flood, it's possible you you actually don't need an angel because these specific giants before the flood became the unclean spirits. And that does not happen after the flood with the giants after the flood. They're, they're a different type of giant. Just because they're tall and they have the same name given to them as a giant doesn't mean they're of the same order of creation or order of manipulated creation, I should say. So let's look at it real quick, okay? So we go to... Jubilees chapter 7, 22 we're going to get some more information about these giants before the flood, and then we're going to look at them directly after the flood. So it says in verse 20 of Jubilee 7, in the 28th Jubilee, Noah began to enjoin upon his sons, that means to, to teach with fervency and, and urgency. He meant to enjoin upon his sons, sons, that means his sons and grandsons, the ordinances and commandments, and all the judgments that he knew. And he exhorted his sons to observe righteousness. And to cover the shame of their flesh, and to bless their Creator, and honor their father and mother, and love their neighbor, and guard their souls from fornication and uncleanness and all iniquity. For, owing to these three things, came the flood upon the earth, namely, owing to the fornication, wherein the watchers against the law of their ordinances, that means they rebelled against why they were sent here, they went whoring after the daughters of men, and took, what, took themselves wives of all whom they chose, and they made the beginning of uncleanness. If you ever wonder where an unclean spirit came from, this is what it's about to explain to us, okay? Also in chapter 10. And they beget sons, the Nephidim. Now, this is the Greek, okay, guys? So the Greek has slightly different translations, but it's actually going to segment three generations of, of their sons. Um, and it says, and they were all unlike. So this, this first generation, excuse me, the Nephidim, they were all unlike, and they devoured one another. And the giants slew the Nephil, and the Nephil slew the Eljo, and the Eljo slew mankind, and then mankind slew one another. This was the, the wickedness that was in the violence that was on the earth continually leading up to the flood. Everyone sold himself to work iniquity and to shed much blood, and the earth was filled with iniquity. And after this, they sinned against the beasts and the birds and all that moves and walks on the earth. And much blood was shed on the earth, and every imagination and desires of men imagined vanity and evil continually. Now, if we actually read here, this is going to be from the antiquity of the Jews. So this is not scripture, but this is just like we've looked in part one and part two of this series. We look at other historical accounts about this time period and see what other people had to record in history considering these events, right? So we're going to look at the antiquity of the Jews by Joseph, uh, Flavius Josephus. And this was a Jewish historian um, who wrote 
you know, a large volume of books trying to re recant history. Okay. So his perspective, again, of these thought, we already established the ideas and, and the synonymous ideas from multiple script things that we would call scripture. So this is a historical account, something that we don't call scripture, but we're going to see a validating testimony in a historical record of what we already consider scriptures. So let's just check, check it out real quick. Now this posterity of Seth continued to esteem God as the Lord of the universe and to have an entire regard to virtue for seven generations. But in process of time, they were perverted and forsook the practices of their forefathers and did neither pay these honors to God, which were appointed them, nor had any concern to do justice towards men. It says, but for what degree of zeal they had formerly shown for virtue, they now showed by their actions a double degree of wickedness, whereby they made God to be their enemy. For many angels of God accompanied with women and beget sons that proved unjust and despisers of all that was good on account of the confidence they had in their own strength. For the tradition is that these men did what, what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians called giants. But Noah was very uneasy at what they did, and being displeased at their conduct, he persuaded them to change their dispositions and their acts for the better. But seeing they did not yield to him, but were slaves to their wicked pleasures, he was afraid they would kill him, together with his wife and children, and those they had married. So he departed out of that land. So this is, the, this is an account from um, a Jewish historian and what he considered, given his you know summary, if you will, of these events that happened. And he actually claims that Noah tried to preach righteousness to them, as you just saw. He tried to get them to, to repent, turn from their ways, but the giants did not want to do that. So on account of their own strength. But now let's look at actually how these giants came to be. Okay, we're going to go back to Enoch chapter seven, verse one through six, and I highlighted here on the screen this idea of enchantments. That they taught they taught the women charms and enchantments. And we're going to go into the next sentence with cutting of roots here in just a minute. But what is this enchantments concept? Well, if we look up the actual word and where it's used in the Hebrew passages, since we actually have a you know a lexiconical definition for it in multiple different scriptures, we can see that enchantments actually comes from the root word of latim, meaning that it's something that's covered or muffled up or a secret act or a trick. And that and the the application of that word is used in Exodus seven and eight multiple times. And this is kind of like when it, Pharaoh's Egyptian, uh, excuse me, Pharaoh's magicians. Uh, did what they did in front of Aaron. The second option for the, this uh, Hebrew term that we see in scriptures for enchantments is the rendering of the Hebrew keshafim, which means muttered spells or incantations or rendered or sorcery. And we also see this in Isaiah 47, 9 and, and the rest of Isaiah 47. We're going to review that chapter here in just a few minutes. But if we go down to number five, we see that Hebrew in the Hebrew, this, this idea of enchantments is also translated for the word kebar, which is used in Isaiah 47, and it does mean magic spells. And it's also exactly what was uh, told, told as, a, you know, as a forbidden practice from the, the Torah in Deuteronomy 18. So this is, comes from this word kebar. It's a, it's a spell. That's literally where the word comes from. And we see in Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 11, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, that's child sacrifice, <coughs> Planned Parenthood, one who uses divination, right? That's We know what divination is. That's the type of, uh, of witchcraft. One who practices witchcraft, and then one who interprets omens or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell or a medium or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead, which is sometimes referred to as necromancy. So this idea that the omens, the sorcery, and the witchcraft, the spells, they're all interconnected. This is all this type of occult behavior. of, And they, and they do other things that are listed out in Leviticus 18 through 20 that um, you guys go read it later, okay? It's very, very adult stuff. So go, go check it out later as far as the detestable practices. Leviticus 18 through 20 actually starts listing off all those detestable practices that the nations outside of Israel were doing. And God's trying to teach them this moment, I don't want you doing any of these things. These are bad. These are really, really bad. Well, those behaviors came from before the flood. This was the beginning of idolatry and the occult behavior started with the rebellious angels teaching these things to their children, the Nephilim, these giants who then perpetuated that down further through the generations. 
So if we go to Isaiah 47, okay, this is a, a unique chapter. Some of you that are more familiar with scriptures, maybe you're going, wait, 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 Sean. Isaiah 47 is during the days of Isaiah. That's during the days like before the Assyrian, either during the time of the Assyrian invasions of the Northern House around 700 BC or a little bit after during maybe the, the days of King Hezekiah, um, you know, like 680 BC. So how does this have to do with the pre-flood giants or the post-flood giants? Well, thank you for sticking around and let me get to it. Isaiah 47, 1 through 5. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no longer be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Remove your veil, strip off your skirt, uncover the leg, cross the rivers. Your nakedness will be uncovered and your shame also will be exposed. I will take vengeance and I will not spare a man. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Sit silently and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no longer be called the Queen of Kingdoms. So this is a prophecy against Babylon during the days of Isaiah. Listen to the descriptions that he gives against Babylon. I was angry with my people. This is Yahweh speaking about Israel. I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage and gave them into your hand. You did not show mercy to them. On the aged, you made your yoke very heavy. Yet you said, I will be a queen forever. These things you did not consider nor remember the outcome of them. And now then, hear this, you central one who dwells securely, who says in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. I will not sit as a widow, nor no loss of children. But these two things will come upon you suddenly in one day, a loss of children and widowhood. They will come on you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries. That's that word in the Hebrew, the kabar, or the keber. In spite of the great power of your spells, you felt secure in your wickedness and said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge, they have deluded you. For you have said in your heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. It goes on. But evil will come on with come on you, which you will not know how to charm away. There it is. Charms and enchantments, spells and sorcery. It's all connected, guys. And disaster will fall on you for which you cannot atone. And destruction about which you do not know will come on you suddenly. Stand fast now in your spells and in your many sorceries, which, which you've labored from your youth. Yahweh is explaining, the Creator is explaining through the prophet Isaiah and prophesying against Babylon, he knows that they've been involved in this type of practice since their youth. So he's talking to a kingdom of Babylon in the days of Isaiah. That's like a thousand years after the Tower of Babel. But he's saying, I know that since your inception, since the days of your youth, you've labored in these practices. That's witchcraft, spells, sorcery, incantations, enchantments, charms. They're still doing it. In the days of Isaiah, they're still doing it today, by the way. We'll get to that in future future parts. But So this is Isaiah acknowledging the same type of behavior that we see was taught before the flood to the giants that was going on since the establishment of the nation of Babylon. So he goes on to say in verse 13, You are wearied with your many counselors. Now let the astrologers and those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict the new moons, stand up and save you from what will come upon you. Behold, they have become like stubble. Fire burns them. They cannot deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There will be no coal to warm, to a warm by uh, nor a fire to sit before. So have those become to you with whom you have labored, who have trafficked with you from your youth. Each has wandered in his own way. There is none to save you. So here we have the father just breaking it down, and he's telling he's telling that through Isaiah, the days of Isaiah, approximately you know seven hundred BC. Speaking to the kingdom of Babylon, acknowledging the behavior during that time was consistent since its youth. This is exactly, many of us already know that the, the Tower of Babel had full-on occultic behavior since they were literally, the point of the tower was they were in rebellion to God. But the question that people start to ask is, well, where did they learn this behavior? How did they come up on this stuff? Like, I thought Noah was a righteous man, and so we have the flood moments. And then everyone that's going to be Noah's, like we just read from Jubilee 720, Noah told his sons and his grandsons he, the commandments that he knew. He taught them righteousness. Why would they stray from it? Well, it just took a few generations before they stopped listening to granddad. It seems to be just the way of human life, right? So this is where let's, we're going to look at Jubilees chapter 10, 5 through 11. Now let's go look. Let's go look at the actual place where... We have the pre-flood giants and what happened to those so that we understand these post-flood giants are not the same thing. Okay, this is I'm, I'm trying to give us 
yeah, we're skipping forward in the, in the timeline, but I'm trying to match ideas for you to understand. The behavior that was taught through the rebellious watchers, the rebellious angels, through their giant sons, and that we see that same behavior pick up after the flood, A lot. Of, that's why a lot of people think, okay, well, these giants must have lived through the flood. Scripture does not say that. Okay, there's only one ancient book that claims that, and it's very suspect. We'll probably cover it on Honor of Kings sometime. There's a lot of problems with it. Um, but basically, all the other accounts we have is just like we read from Enoch and Jubilees. You have the sons, and like if you go to Enoch chapter 10, the sons of the watchers are all destroyed, just like Jubilees chapter 7 says, take a sword, Jubilees 5 and chapter 7, take a sword to those sons of the watchers. Those giants were killed before the flood. Their physical bodies were dead. And then their, their fathers, the rebellious angels, were locked away in the center of the earth, in a pit of the earth, which not a ball earth, but a biblical cosmological shaped earth. So let's read what happened to those giants who were killed before the flood, because Noah's going to be talking about them after the flood. So here in Jubilees chapter 10, 5 through 11, and this is Noah speaking to Yahweh through a prayer. And he says, And you know how your watchers, the father of these spirits, they acted in my day. As for these spirits which are living, imprison them. Hold them fast in the place of condemnation. Let them not bring destruction on the sons of your servant, my God, for, for these are malignant, and they're created in order to destroy. Let them not rule over the spirits of the living, for you alone can exercise dominion over them. And let them not have power over the sons of the righteous from here forward and forevermore. And the Lord our God bade us, that's the angel narrating the book of Jubilees. He's saying the Lord our God bade us, bade, it instructed the angels to bind all of these unclean spirits, which were the disembodied spirits of the giants from before the flood. And the chief of the spirits, Mastima, he came and he said, Lord, creator, let some of them remain before me and let them hearken to my voice and do all that I shall say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these spirits are for the corruption and leading astray before my judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men. And he said, that's Yahweh responds and says, let the tenth part of these unclean spirits remain before Mastima. And let the other nine parts of these unclean spirits descend into the place of condemnation. So the angel then says, and one of us, he commanded that we should teach Noah all their medicines. For he knew that they would not walk in uprightness nor strive in righteousness. And we did according to all his words. All the malignant evil ones were bound in a place of condemnation, but a tenth part of them were left that they might be subject before Satan on the earth. So guys, for if this is your first time to ever watch Kingdom of Context, we've done a few videos on this in the past, but just as a, as a loving reminder, this is where unclean spirits came from. The demons, the unclean spirits that Yeshua is kicking out of people in the Gospels, right? Without the book of Enoch and the book of Jubilees, you do not know where they came from. These two books blatantly tell you they're the disembodied spirits of the giants from before the flood. That's the only place where they come from. The giants after the flood are not fathered by rebellious angels because those angels that did that, they're locked away. And the father does not tell us other angels came down to do this. Any place in the scriptures that I can ever find. It's not there. Because you don't need to have them. To have a tall person, you don't need to have a spiritual father who's an angel. In fact, as we're going to explain real quick, I, I would submit that wasn't the cause of their height. Just the fact that their the women had husbands who were angels doesn't automatically mean the baby's going to be a big giant. No, there's a reason why we were reviewing the behavior, the occultic behavior that was taught from the watchers to mankind during that time, specifically also to their giant sons. Part of that was charms and enchantments, which is sorcery, spells, omens. And another part of it is the cutting of roots and making them acquainted with plants. And so I'll go into this just real quick. So a lot of people aren't aware that within plants and the roots of plants and trees, that there's five growth hormones and they're auxins, cytokinins, gibberellins, ethylene, and abscisic acid. And these particular growth hormones, they determine how, how tall the plant sprouts before it starts budding leaves, how big the leaves are, how big the stems are that produce the leaves, how deep the roots grow, how thick the actual stem is. All those different things that have programmed instructions through chemical hormones. Anyone that understands genetics, you're very familiar with this already. If you're not, I'm giving you a, a very, very small crash course in the idea of how genetics works. And it's through 
you know, your RNA and DNA, but also it's, it's um, implemented through your chemical receptors of growth hormones. So this is where right off the bat, the angels are genetically manipulating their, their offspring. This is why we'll go back to the verse real quick. This is why it says they taught them charms and enchantments and then the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with plants. And the next sentence says, and they, that's the women became pregnant and bare great giants. They had great kids as giants. This is, this is why it's being told to you in that order. It's telling you what they're doing. We just have to know what the definitions of the words are that's being used in that passage in Enoch for, uh, chapter 7. This is the biology behind the idea of what cutting roots means. And it's a manipulation of growth hormones. Gibberellins is one of the second most important growth hormones. Uh, it's, it's named after a fungus but it causes the rice plants to grow up normally tall and uh, in Japan. It can be synthesized in portions of the stems and roots, which means it can be manufactured in a lab. And there's more than 60 types of gibberellins that they've discovered and, and played with. And a lot of people don't realize this, but um, gibberellins is one of, used to be one of the main ingredients of miracle Grow, the stuff you put on your plants and in your garden to help things grow. That's literally what, they're, what you were putting on your plants was gibberellins. Now, over time, they've taken some of these 60 various types and they, they have very long scientific words that they put on the packaging label. Uh, so they don't call them gibberellins now, but it is from gibberellins. That's where this concept comes from. It's literally miracle Grow came from the idea of cutting roots. In case you guys don't know that. So this is what's going on with, with the, the watchers, extremely important, excuse me, extremely intelligent from heaven above. They have more knowledge than mankind. They take wives and they genetically manipulate the birth of the babies that they're having. That when these kids come out, they're huge. Uh, or we just went into Jubilee chapter 10 that tells us what happened to those kids, right? As we already read that. But now let's jump to the post-flood giants. We're going to look at Egypt, Greece, and Babylon, just like we did in part two. And we're going to see evidence of from their recorded history that we still haven't uh, through archaeology and anthropology. We can see that they all had records of giants. You can see on screen here, this is uh, Egyptian giants <laughs> putting up either just standing next to it for scale and size or helping actually erect these obelisk monuments you see all over Egypt, which are the size of a four story building. In, in Greece, they had tons of stories of giants and chimeras and mixed animals, animals that were all, you know, mixed together. They had the, uh, what was it? The, the centaur, the minotaur, they had the, uh, the, the chimeron, um, which was like, like half man, half horse, as well as a, a, a centaur. And I mean, there's, and they had these great stories in their history. Now we, and today we call it mythology, but back then they, they thought it was, they were telling their history. They didn't call it mythology back then. They were talking about these quote unquote gods that ruled their area. And they had these great feats of strength and could do these amazing things, could take on, you know, these strange creatures that they talked about that were like hybrids of various creatures put together. Um, you have in one of their artwork here, a large man wrestling a, a, another, what we call an aerial. That's a kind of a chimera creation is part lion, part man. And then we've got in Babylon, you've got ancient hieroglyphs from ancient Samaria and Chaldea of huge rulers talking to, you know, the servants that come up to him. And guys, a lot of, you know, the, the modern day scholars or the modern modern day people in academia, they'll try to tell you, oh, well, see that, you know, you're you're not understanding history like that. That's just they were just drawing them. The rulers sitting on the throne, they were just drawing them bigger to show importance. Guys, no, it's everywhere. It's all over the place in their literature. They have various heights of different people. There's super tall giants. There's medium giants. There's small, regular people. Um, these people knew how to draw scale specifically. And they, we have record of the giants from multiple manuscripts in history, not just hieroglyphs. So let's let's go and let's jump into it a little further. So the question is that a lot of people ask is where post flood did they get this idea that they can make big dudes? Wasn't Noah teaching them righteousness? Noah wouldn't be teaching them this stuff, right? Jubilees chapter eight, one through four. 
In the 29th Jubilee, in the first week, in the beginning thereof, our fact said, took to himself a wife, and her name was Razuja, the daughter of Susan, the daughter of Elam. And she bare a son in the third year of this week and called his name Canaan, and that's Greek for Canaan. And the son grew, and his father taught him writing, and he went to seek for himself a place where he might seize for himself a city. Well, that's already right off the <laughs> right off the bat. This kid Canaan or Canaan, uh, he's he's displaying you know bad moral character. You don't you don't go seize a city. Um, and he found a writing which former generations had carved on the rock, and he read what was thereon. This is former generations, and this is after the flood by two or three generations. And he read what was on that rock, and he transcribed it, and he sinned owing to it. For it contained the teaching of the watchers in accordance with which they used to observe the omens of the sun and moon and stars and all the signs of heaven. And he wrote it down and said nothing regarding it, for he was afraid to speak to Noah about it, lest he should be angry with him on account of it. So this guy found the teachings of the rebellious watchers written down on a rock after the flood, after, I guess, the water dried out enough, or he found the right cave, or who knows. Who knows where this thing was and if it's still in existence today, I, I couldn't tell you. But this, according to the Book of Jubilees, that's how this information from the watchers from before the flood started permeating back into the culture through the sons and grandsons of Noah after the flood. And this is only a couple generations here. Our fact says just a couple generations down from Noah. So right off the bat, now you've got in this in this you know couple hundred years after the flood, the children of Noah are discovering these things that to observe the omens of the sun, moon, and stars, and all the signs in heaven. You guys remember what we read, not just in Deuteronomy 18, also in Deuteronomy 4, 19, as well as in Jubilee 7. Um, that It's also in Enoch chapter 8 uh, and a whole bunch of other places that they, they lump in their astrology with their actual occult behavior of sorcery and spells. That's what we also read in Isaiah 47. So this is why we're seeing this guy pick up some of these teachings. And then this is the exact generation you start seeing them start to go out and conquer, create empires. This is where Nimrod and Genesis chapter 10 would come into play where he went out and seized multiple cities for himself, just like this guy was doing. And in fact, if you go on to read the rest of Jubilees chapter 8, it tells you that the grandson of this guy, Canaan, which was Eber, he actually married Nimrod's daughter. So Nimrod's already on the scene. He's already a part of this storyline in the background of Jubilees chapter eight in this moment right here. So let's go here real quick to just to give you guys for, for some people out there that might be saying, well, I don't, I don't like Jubilees. I would say, please go check, you know, go check out our videos we've done on Jubilees here on the channel. Um, we've shown with abundance how Jubilees historically and uh, textually is validated through history, even from, you know, Modern day Hebrew scholars even evaluate that Jubilees was a, a central part of scripture for the Hebrews before the first century AD. So if we look here, we can see that in the Greek Septuagint, it actually matches up with Jubilees because it was it was translated from the Greek, as well as Luke, which was originally written in Greek as well. So Jubilees 8, 1 through 4, it tells us our facts had had a son whose name was Canaan. Jubilee, Genesis 10, 24 in the Septuagint, it tells you that our facts had had a son named Canaan. And then Luke 3.36 says that Canaan was the son of Arphaxad. So we have we have multiple places of validation for this story in Jubilees here to understand where these teachings came from and started coming back into culture and society post-flood. These giants start re-emerging. Let's go back to Jewish historian Josephus talking in Antiquity of the Jews, chapter 4. He's going to be talking about the same stuff here. He says, now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah. Nimrod was a bold man and of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as if it was through his means that they were happy. This is the first dictator, guys. But to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. So I just want to throw this. I mean, I don't know if you guys have ever read 1984 or um, if you've ever studied communist mentalities and mantras. They all have propaganda. And in communism, it is the state they want to. They want. They always want to get rid of God. They don't want you to give any credit to God. They want you to give all credit to the state for your happiness, and then they want to say you attain that happiness through glorifying the state, which is the communist government, because you did it yourself through your own courage, which is usually fostered through some sort of revolution. This is the literally since the days of of the Tower of Babel is the origins and the perpetuating cycle of communism. 
You have a guy convinces the people to revolt and revolution. He then that spiritually, that political movement is always mixed with atheism. And then he tries to convince the people that he's the reason they should be happy as a representative and controller of the state of the governance. So that that happiness was brought about because of their courage to go through that revolution. This is just the cycle of communism. Okay. And this is what is actually trying to be perpetrated on the world today, but that's a different show. So this is a, I'll go back to this real quick and finish up this, this little portion here. It says he, that's Nimrod also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence on his power. It's exactly what's happening in multiple countries today. He also said he would re be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. So what do we read from Jubilees and Enoch? The forefathers that Nimrod is revering were wicked, were the Nephilim. The purpose of the Tower of Babel Yes, it's rebellion toward God. Yes, it's literally trying to ascend to the actual layer of the firmament and get through it so he can take God off the throne and fight God. But it's in reverence to the Nephilim that came before him, the giants pre-flood. What happened with those giants post-flood? They're still on the earth. Noah prayed about them. Their spirits are still here. Their bodies are dead, but their spirits are still here. Help, God. He's like... Got it. I'll take 90% of them off. Satan, he has 10% control because otherwise there will be nothing left to try to tempt mankind. There'll be no, there'll be no true example for mankind to show good obedience and walk in righteousness. When we walk in righteousness, we can have authority over the unclean spirits. It's that simple. Jesus exemplified that. But when you walk in wickedness, you're being seduced by the unclean spirits. That's what Jubilees 10 just told us, verses 1 through 10. So it is that, that those spirits were created in order to oppress, destroy, afflict, and attack the sons of men. Also, in Jubilees, uh, first Enoch chapter 15 explains this as well. That's what they're doing post-flood. And they attacked, oppressed, and destroyed the mind of Nimrod. Now he's revering the fallen forefathers pre-flood of old, who were drowned in the flood. And all that wickedness that preceded, he's revering that as something that he's disagreeing with the judgment of the flood. How often have we seen that among atheists? It's one of their biggest arguments in the atheist community is the flood was unjust. How dare God kill all those people? And they ignore the fact that all those people were killing each other, eating each other and drinking blood and, you know, sacrificing children, doing all kinds of horrific stuff. They ignore all that because they revere the idea that how dare he make that decision? To actually execute justice on very unjust peoples. How dare he stop all the violence on the earth? This is this is the mentality of the atheist. This is exactly what we're reading from Nimrod and how he seduced the people who created the, the city and the Tower of Babel into one governance. And it's the same mentality that's resurging throughout the world today. So let's keep going real quick. This is we'll go to uh part three of chapter four of the antiquities of the Jews, where it says, now the multitude were very ready to follow the determination of Nimrod and to esteem it a piece of cowardice to submit to God. The people were following Nimrod and they were, they had been duped to think that it was cowardice to submit to God. So they built a tower, neither sparing any pains, nor being in any degree negligent about the work. And by reason of the multitude of their hands employed in it, it grew very high, sooner than anyone could expect, but the thickness of it was so great, and it was so strongly built, that thereby its great height seemed, upon the view, to be less than it really was. It was built of burnt brick, cemented together with mortar, made of bitumen, that it might not be liable to emit water. When God saw that they acted so madly, he did not resolve to destroy them utterly, since they were not grown wiser by the destruction of their former sinners, but he caused a tumult among them, by producing in them diverse languages and causing that through the multitude of those languages, they should not be able to understand one another. The place wherein they built the tower is now called Babylon, because of the confusion of that language, which they readily understood before. For the Hebrews mean by the word Babel, confusion. And it goes on to say, 
The Sybil also makes mention of this tower and the confusion of the language when she says this, when all the men were of one language, some of them built a high tower as if they had already thereby ascended up to heaven. But the gods sent storms of winds and overthrew the tower and gave everyone his peculiar language. And for this reason, it was that city was called, it was that that's the city was called Babylon. But as to the plain, the, the plain, excuse me, the typo, as to the plain of Shinar in the country of Babylonia, Hestius mentions it when he says this, such of the priests as were saved took the sacred vessels of Jupiter and Ialias and came to Shinar of Babylonia. So the reason I pointed this out, guys, is because Jupiter is the god of the Greeks, or excuse me, the god of the Romans that they, that they just adopted from the Greeks, okay? He's the god of the sky and thunder and the king of the gods in ancient Rome religion and mythology. And if anyone's seen part two, you can see what he's holding in his hand. He's got a Vajra in his hand. This was his thunderbolt. He was the chief deity of the Roman state religion throughout the Republic and the Imperial eras. Now, just real quick, I want everyone to not get too confused here. The reason why we're talking about the Romans, many people may say, but wait, the Romans were way down the road. It's because Josephus is living during the time of Roman occupation. So Jupiter was this is why he was telling us in his book that during the days of Babylonia, they took the, the priests took the vessels of the sanctuary of Jupiter to Babylonia to the Tower of Babel. So what I'm getting at here, guys, as you can see on screen here, Jupiter was just the name that the Romans gave what the Greeks called Zeus. Same guy. We talked about Zeus last week. So different culture takes over. The, you know, the Greeks are subdued. They, they have, they're literally worshiping the same type of gods because it's all the same occult pantheon of gods. So, and the Romans called Zeus by the name Jupiter. This idea is that this is what Josephus is telling us. He could have been using the name Zeus. It's synonymous. It doesn't matter. He's telling the priests of Babylon brought the vessels of Jupiter, the vessels of Zeus to Babylonia to the, the kingdom of Babylon to this this tower that Nimrod was building. That's the context of that whole passage he's talking about. So the point of why I'm saying this, guys, that means before the tower was built, there was already idolatry and worshiping false gods of the sky that they call Jupiter, that they assigned to specific constellations. So this is why I'm trying to tell you there's a direct correlation to astrology and their actual occultic behavior of sorcery, enchantments, omens. This is literally why they named their gods and the constellations the same names. This is what Deuteronomy 419 says, that they're, they're erring uh, by looking to the stars and committing idolatry because the behavior matched the stars. So this was, it goes a little deeper than that, but that's a whole nother show. Just trying to, I'm trying to help you understand why you're, you're seeing these words being used in reference to Babylon and Nimrod and the city. Point is, the occult did not start with ancient Babylon. Yes, they, as Isaiah 47 tells us, ancient Babylon labored in the behaviors of the occult since their inception, since their youth. But before Nimrod assembled the people and decided to build a tower in a city and call it, and it became eventually known as the Tower of Babel and Babylon, before all that, they were already worshiping false gods. They were already in, deep in idolatry. This is why I read you Jubilees 8, who was actually a couple generations before the generation of Nimrod, supposedly it just, it gets tricky on the, on the timeline, but it's in the rough geographical timeline. The point is they'd already started idolatry before that. They already had priesthoods set up. that were not the priesthoods of Noah and Shem. These other priests worshiping, worshiping Zeus and Jupiter, there's specifically Zeus before, uh, during the days of the tower of Babel, they carried that with them to Babylon in defiance of what Noah and Shem were doing because Noah and Shem were worshiping Yahweh, the God, the true, the only God of heaven and earth. So the point is it's, I, I'm trying to give some context to the time period. Okay. A lot of people think it was just Noah had a bunch of babies off the boat and they all grew up and had little towns around them. And then suddenly they wanted to go off and build a tower of Babel. No, they were already steeping into the behavior of the watchers and the Nephilim before the flood, before the tower of Babel even became a thing. And I would put forward the post flood Nephilim, which I, I tried to show a few minutes ago, the post flood Nephilim is simply the genetic manipulation from roots of plants and trees while a woman is pregnant. This is why we see them reemerge 
after the flood. And all their architecture and their buildings and all their hieroglyphs, there's giants everywhere, even around the timeline of the Tower of Babel. So it's very, it's very easy connection, truly very easy connection. You don't need more angels coming down and impregnated women. You just need the, the, the things of the earth to be used in a manipulative way outside of the order of God to change the order of things that are happening. And suddenly you have babies being born with different, you know, uh, growth hormones affecting their genetics in during gestation. And they come out to grow up to be super huge. So we see that going forward in the scriptures. We see that not just post flood immediately after the flood, like I showed you in Jubilees, um, where they're suddenly dabbling into the behaviors of the watchers, but then you start to see it literally recorded as giants when you get to the, around the days of, of Moses, basically. Now, a lot of people would already say that during, you know, Genesis 14, Abraham was interacting with, uh, I think his name was Anner, Eshel, and, and Mamre, and they were supposedly giants as well, but that sometimes it's hard to, hard to pin that one down. But with the verses I'm going to show you right now, we can easily pin down that there were giants post-flood after, after the flood, after the Tower of Babel, because the Tower of Babel wasn't the starting point for the giants or for the occult. It was already back in Jubilees 8, a few generations up with this guy named Canaan. That's where it started flourishing and getting back. And to me, that's where they would have the manpower and the physical strength and labor to be able to, to start making these huge metallic um, ziggurats and pyramids and obelisks and the Tower of Babel itself. And they actually had the physical labor power through the giants to do stuff like that and why the, you know, they could achieve such mega, mega structures, if you will. So let's read Numbers 13, 20 through 33. Many of you guys are familiar with this, but we're going to just show how they're prevalent after and they're called Nephilim and they're called um, giants in the same in the same breath, but they're not fathered by angels. So this is why from the inception of the city and the tower, from the beginnings, from the youth of Babylon up until the days of Isaiah, there's still giants. They're everywhere. Numbers 13, 28 through 33. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. The cities are fortified, very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. And Amalek is in the land of the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country. The Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with them said, We are not able to go up against the people. They're too strong for us. So they gave out the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone and spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, so we were in their sight. Just trying to give you some scale about how big they were. It's pretty big, by the way, if that's a, any kind of literal scale. But even if these people were, you know, 20, 30 feet, um, you know, like um, yeah, it mentions the Amorites up here in verse 29. And Amos chapter 2, I think it's verse 9, says that the Amorites were the height of cedar trees. Well, cedar trees can grow really, really tall, guys. They can grow to be like, uh, what is it, 30 feet tall or the small cedar trees, 50 feet tall. I mean, that's a three, four-story building. That's a, that's big. So, yeah, you'd feel like a grasshopper standing next to someone that big. Deuteronomy 2, 9 through 12. And the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab, nor provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of their land as a possession, because I have given Ar to the sons of Lot as a possession. Verse 10 says, the Emim lived there formerly, a people as great, numerous, and tall as the Anakim. We just read about the Anakim. They said they were part of the Nephilim in Numbers 13. And then now it's it's saying that the Emim are a very similar clan, like the Anakim, and just as tall. It says, like the Anakim, they're also regarded as Rephaim, but the Moabites call them the Emim. And the Horites formerly lived in Seir, but the sons of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place, just as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord God gave to them. So just a further validation of another clan that's referenced as tall as the Anakim, who were considered Nephilim. But this other specific clan was called of the Rephaim. And we know that Og, who's mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 3, was of the Rephaim as well. He's one of the last versions of them. And no, Og did not survive the flood. 
um, we'll, we'll do a different, a different uh, story on Og some other time. But these are just clans of, of giants that had been around for several hundred years between the days of Moses and Noah. There's, you know, what is it? Between Moses back to Noah, you have approximately, what, five, six hundred years? Yeah. Um, Joshua chapter 11, 21 through 22. And then Joshua came at that time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron and Deber and Anab, from all the hill country of Judah and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua utterly, utterly destroyed them with their cities. There were no Anakim left in the land of the sons of Israel. Only the Anakim were only left in Gaza and in Gath and in Ashdod. Some remained. That's in the areas near the coastland where the Philistines controlled them. So, 1 Samuel 17, 4 says, A champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath, and he was from Gath. We just read Joshua 11. The only giants that remained, the only Anakim who were of the Nephilim, remained in Gath and Ashdod and Gaza in the territory of the Philistines. This is where Goliath comes from in 1 Samuel 17. So guys, we go back to Isaiah 47, 11 through 15. The reason why we mentioned this earlier, because remember it says in verse 12, Yahweh is telling them in, in almost like in mockery form. He's telling Babylon that he's about to judge. Stand fast now in your spells and your many sorceries with which you've labored from your youth. And he goes on in verse 15 to say, so have those become to you with whom you have labored, who have trafficked with you from your youth. So this is where he's mixing in their spells, their sorceries, their omens with their bad behavior, their astrology, as in verse 13, is mixed in with this kind of behavior. This is the behavior of Babylon since its youth. This is the behavior that was rampant throughout all the nations that practiced idolatry. But I'm trying to draw a specific focus just to, to Babylon through this series. But this is why in Revelation 18, verse 23, future Babylon is described as the same concept. And in the light of the lamp will not shine in you any longer. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. They were deceived by their sorcery. What is this sorcery, guys? Charms and enchantments, magical spells, tricks, secret arts. This is that sorcery, charms and enchantments. What was how was the practical use of that sorcery that we saw tonight in our in our presentation? Is that they were not just doing worshiping idols according to astrology, but their practices that's listed out for us in Deuteronomy 18 and Leviticus 18 through 20 included. The practice of sorcery and spells, enchantments, necromancy, pharmakia, all this stuff. You guys, you guys know what pharmakia is? You guys, do you guys realize that's why I had this on screen? This picture right here with the genetic, the DNA, and, and the changing of the the DNA. It's a part of pharmakia. So this is why I'm trying to show you this. This practice goes way back to when the the rebellious watchers came down and started having children started having manipulated genetic children. And that type of genetic manipulation picked up after the flood and has carried on ever since. And it will carry on until Yeshua returns on the day of the Lord. And this is what future Babylon will be judged for. We're going to go into future Babylon, um, both mother and daughter in the future. We read about daughter Babylon in Isaiah 47 tonight, right? So just remember that when we get to future Babylon, we're going to read about both of them, break both of them down, explain because it has to do with the, the Nephilim, the, the, which are the unclean spirits, has to do with Satan, has to do with um, prophecy, has to do with a whole bunch of stuff. It's all going to tie together. Again, I'm trying to build a foundation for you so that when we get there, you can understand how we got there, what the words mean, so that you're not taking New Testament literature out of context from the Old Testament. This is, you know, we try to keep things in context here.